We're calling this series The Gospel for Christians. And, the, and uh, oh, yes, thanks, Annika. So I actually have printed sermon notes today. Uh, I'm not going to be offended if you walk up right now and go to the back of that shelf and grab a sheet and a clipboard. Not, not offended at all. Feel free to do that if you want to take paper notes instead of the online stuff. I'm a techie guy. It's nice. You can, send the e- you can email the notes yourself at end, but some people like the paper and pen. That's fine. Uh, but I have that today. But Gospel for Christians. So uh, the reason we're calling it that is because if you read the Gospel of Mark, and you read about the content of Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of Mark, you'll find that there's no content on what actually is taught by Jesus, like the other Gospels have, these grand, you know, massive parables and such. I'll give some examples, but what, uh, what you do see in the Gospel of Mark is how people responded to his teaching and how he had authority in his teaching and how he was viewed when he taught, which is really important to the story of the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark is also, I'd say, I'd say it's, like, it's, like a, um, it's like a good movie from a famous director. You know, some, I, I said earlier in the series that you have, uh, you know, you have your, your, your favorite directors of movies. That's kind of like the, the books of our day and, and in this generation now. So if I said like Martin Scorsese, right, or Quentin Tarantino, I wouldn't want to encourage you to watch his films if I'm saying it for officially from the pulpit. Uh, I'm just naming famous directors, right? Or Steven Spielberg, you know, you name it. They have a style, right? They have a certain uh, way of telling a story. That's what Mark is to the Bible. Mark is telling the story in a particular way. And in fact, the the story itself is very much a narrative. It's not necessarily meant to point out real-life people or events or things, although you pretty much can fill in the blank with a lot of these things. Uh, But he's telling the story and narrative of certain themes that pop out, and that's what I want to see as we kind of spend a long journey and we go back and forth. Sometimes we take pauses like we did for Christmas. Uh, but to really systematically go through, and what I hope will happen as you continue to go through, if, you, if you're one of those people that can stay long enough to, to watch, like, I don't know, 35 to 50 sequels of a movie of the Gospel of Mark, and you, you get a much deeper understanding of the whole book and what it's trying to say. And so in the middle of chapter 2, we're kind of in the middle of, of the discourse of kind of the Jesus making the same point over and over, kind of, uh, every single week. We're in like 3 of 5. We'll continue with that next week. But uh, we're going to start in verse 18 today as he's talking about fasting today. So it'll be really interesting with that. So if you have a Bible, I'll read from the NIV. If not, we'll have it on the screen as well. Here's what Mark uh, records. It says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Let's pray together. God, I ask in this moment, as always, that my words would be your words, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us both individually and collectively together. Uh, God, I pray for those uh, who are curious about you, who are checking things out, um, and don't really know what this is all about, God, I pray today that you would illuminate their hearts to see how incredibly loving you are, um, how powerful you are, and what you call the church to be. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. amen. Well, for those of you that don't know me very well, and even if you do know me well, you'll know this, there'll be a little review, but I, uh, my story, I didn't grow up in church. In fact, I grew up hating Christians, and uh, so it's, it's really interesting to talk to some of my old friends. Uh, it, to, to see what I'm doing now, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just mind-blowing to many of my old friends. Uh, the fact that I'm, one, a Christian, and number two, a pastor uh, at a church is pretty ridiculous. So uh, that said, I had a lot of critiques against the church when I was younger. And uh, as I got in the church life, you know, I brought that kind of edge with me because I wasn't familiar with church life. I had a, a really steep learning curve. Sometimes I feel like I'm still doing that now. I mean, I'm pretty much going to do that the rest of my life. But especially back then, I was pretty naive to a lot of things in church life. No one really taught me anything. I just kind of, kind of trial by fire, if you will. And one of the things that perplexed me as a person that was outside the church, getting in church life, is that um, I started hearing conversations and, and phrases that people would say that was really odd to me. And I'm just like, really? Is this 
how things are. And I would say, um, you know, now kind of like 25, 30 some years later, I would say if uh, this phrase that I heard is probably one of the famous phrases if you want to guarantee that your church will die. And that phrase is this. We've never done it that way before. Any of you ever heard that phrase before? Or said that phrase, maybe? We've never done it that way before. And, and sometimes it's a good thing. I mean, you know, it's, it's like a curious thing. Yeah, we haven't done it that way. But there's other times where that has been said in reference to churches wanting to branch out to try new things or, you know, start new things or what have you. And then there's pushback from people. Well, we've never re- really done it that way before. You know, I, I don't know if we really can do that. Or I don't, you know, they kind of ask some, some questions. So let me give you an example of this. So I was in a church long ago uh, as a youth pastor, and we had this interesting ministry as, and I don't like the labels, but they, they labeled them the street kids. So there would literally be these uh, people from the street that would just hang out around a church building, and we were kind of in a more low-income part of the, of, the, of the town. And they would just, like, sit across the street and smoke cigarettes. And uh, I remember I, I, I was really excited about the opportunity to be there just because I, I mean, it was just baffling to me that there's 120 of, of these people. They're literally hanging out in the street just smoking cigarettes in the church parking lot. And so uh, I remember uh, <laughs> the first day I was there, uh, we had a Wednesday night program kind of thing where we basically fed the community meal so they'd all come in and eat. And then they had basketball that some of them would play and then they had some other activities. Uh, and I, just, I saw them smoking, so I, just wa- I grabbed a coffee can an old coffee came from the kitchen and just walked outside. And the guy's like, what are you doing? I, I'm, I'm going to talk to him. You are? I'm like, yeah. So I go and talk to him and have a good conversation. And uh, they, the first question they asked me is like, are you going to tell us to stop smoking? And I said, do I look like the smoking police? You know, you know like, what are you, I, <laughs> I go, what are you going to do? You're gonna, I go, if I tell you not to smoke, what are you going to do? You're going to walk down the street. You're going to put your, you're going to throw your cigarette butts out in that parking lot right there, right? Yeah. Here. I just put the coffee can down. Just put them in there. That'd just help us out. We really appreciate it. I said, hey, could you do me a favor too? Could you walk up to these older ladies that are coming for choir practice and could you escort them across the street because there's some crazy people that drive uh, in the street. They don't slow down to 25. Yeah, sure. And of course, the old la- older ladies were freaking out. I'm, uh, you know, I'm just, I mean, you would, right? I mean, some, you know, some tatted guy like JJ comes up to you and like, you know, like, wait, you don't know him from the broad side of a barn. You're like, Chage is an awesome dude, by the way, if you don't know him. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, is, it was really fun. Now, after a while, I mean, it was, it was so much, I mean, such an enjoyable ministry. But what ended up happening uh, after a while is, like, there was very few people that wanted to enter in to that space, right? They would kind of keep it a distance. And then things really got awry when stuff in the building started getting destroyed. So, so there's things that get broken in the building. It costs money. And then... Some of the people who were really passionate about those things in the building came up to me and said, you know, you need to do something about these street kids breaking the stuff. So I decided to do some investigating. And guess what I found out of who actually destroyed the building? You know who it was? It was our own church students that destroyed the building. They were just running awry with everybody else, but they are the ones actually causing destruction. Uh, so then what do I say? And like, well, oh, they couldn't do that. They're, they're, a, they're the sweetest kid. And you, when you, add, and you confront those things. And yet I still kept running into resistance over and over when I wanted to try to try new things with these street kids. I didn't like calling them that because they came to church every week. And they were, they were coming to events every once in a while with youth. And our, but the, the church kids didn't like them. They didn't like coming. I mean, there's all sorts of tension, which I enjoyed. Uh, but it just, it just really became a problem after a while. What ended up happening is that I couldn't get anything done because it was so hard to convince people that this was um, a worthy ministry to try to invest in. And there's, there's a longer story to that, but there's many situations like that in churches. I mean, I've, I just, I've heard like three or four stories in the last month of churches other, in this area who have had really unique things happen, and people inside the church community squash it because they're taking over our building, or they're, they're not the right types of people to be in here, or that's a really questionable group. Or do you know if they're, you know, do we need to watch our stuff more carefully? I mean, there's all sorts of things that get said. And I, I, I mentioned this example, and I mentioned this phrase, because I really think that is at the heart of what Jesus is talking about in this text today. The subject is fasting, but the principle is the same. What was interesting to me about the situation that I was in is that what ended up happening is there's nothing wrong with taking care of your facility, right? I mean, we have a facility. Uh, it's, it's not big, 
but we, we, I just talked about being able to use it more in the community, right? Obviously, that comes with a cost, which is things are going to break down faster when you use it more, right? And you're going to have to pay for that. How are you going to pay for that? Well, you want to be good stewards of the building you have. Yes, all that's true. But it comes to a point when you're, you're having these relationships in ministry, and what ended up happening with this particular church is that the building became more important than the people. And I'm going to tell you right now, if that ever happens here, I guarantee you that is the recipe for church dying. Guaranteed. When, when a building becomes more important than people, we're in trouble. In fact, what's interesting is in the New Testament, when you talk about the church, the church is not a building, right? It's a group of people. In fact, I mean, I've, I've talked about this in Torah Club. You know, one of the things that was interesting about uh, in the 300s, when Constantine became Roman emperor, he legalized Christianity, which was good because now Christians don't get killed for just being a Christian, but he turned every imperial temple into a church building, which had its, it's like a double-edged sword. It was great in some ways, but then the state took over the religion, and it caused all sorts of problems because the building became more important than the people and protecting that structure. And so when they're asking about fasting, it's a really interesting thing because Jesus has a really kind of crazy response to this. And it seems like it really doesn't make sense, but I think in a lot of ways his response is a lesson for him in helping these scribes of the Pharisees, a lesson in missing the point of fasting. Because, you know, you, you know if you follow this series so far, and I'll kind of catch you up a little bit, um, in the passages before this, already in this middle of chapter 2 of Mark, Jesus has already done all the wrong, wrong things with all the wrong people, right? He's been with a woman alone and actually touched her. He wasn't supposed to do that. He was with lepers and paralytics and tax collectors. I mean, he's hanging out with all the wrong people as a Jewish rabbi, and they're letting him know it. We've already, that's, that's, we're literally one and a half chapters into Mark, and that's where we're at. And now they're, they've switched from people to practices. Now we're talking about what we do as a Jew. And fasting is a big deal. I mean, fasting is a big deal to a Jew. It's a, it's a really significant practice. It was something that was very important to them. Much of the time, you know, m- most, most of the time when you fast, I mean, the purpose of fasting was one, to remember all of the horrible things that have happened in the past for a Jewish person and to hope for the kingdom of God to arrive in the future. That's why you fast. You fast longing for the Messiah to come and the kingdom of God to arrive. That's why you fast. And, but it, and this is something that's built into the rhythm of life for a Jewish person, which I deeply appreciate. It's something that we don't really talk about as much. We'll talk about a little bit today. Um, but it's odd because Jesus obviously is ignoring the whole thing, right? The Pharisees, like, the scribes, the Pharisees are like, hey, John the Baptist's disciples do this? Our disciples do this, but your disciples don't. Are you just like ignoring like all of this tradition of like hoping for the kingdom of God to arrive? I mean, this is about the salvation of Israel. You're a Jewish rabbi, you're just ignoring it? How could you even do that? It seems, I mean, it's, it's pretty much like heresy to a Jew for him to do something like this. Um, I, mean, they weren't, I mean, they weren't just complaining, they were accusing in a sense. Of like, this is not something that you should do. It's like, it's like almost like, a, you know, someone today calling someone a heretic in church. I mean, that's the kind of seriousness that they're, they're taking this when they're asking these questions. Now, we really get to the nitty-gritty of this. Um, because, look, you know, the Pharisees, again, I've talked about this before. Every, we want to label the Pharisees in a bad way a lot of times in the Bible. And first of all, it's not all Pharisees that act that way. I mean, we can easily generalize. But uh, they had a particular posture about how to do church and what's important. And this is what is at the crux of what Jesus is responding. He's like, look, the the purpose of fasting is to bring the kingdom of God into the present. And Jesus says, okay. And then he gives an example. He gives a response to this. He says, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on on that day they will fast. In other words, what he's saying by saying that he said, look, you're longing for the kingdom of God to arrive, and by the practice and by the question you're asking me, I'm telling you, the kingdom of God has arrived. Like, it's him. 
That's announced all throughout all the Gospels. When Jesus comes, the kingdom of God has arrived, right? We talked about this in our Christmas series, right? When, Jesus, when God became a baby, we talked about the temple, like he became the temple. The temples where heaven and earth meet, right? So heaven and earth meet in Jesus. You're seeing the, 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 the union of heaven and earth in Jesus. The kingdom of God has arrived. The kingdom of God being the reign of heaven coming to earth. That's the kingdom of God coming. Jesus is like, I'm him, he's here. So he gives this example of the bridegroom. It's like, I think about it this way. I mean, I'll try to modernize it. You, have you ever been to a big wedding before? Man, they're awesome. I don't know if you've been to a big wedding that has a nice, awesome reception. Uh, sometimes, there was a time in my life in my 20s, which was glorious, because I got to go to a wedding like every month, it felt like. And man, there's lots of free food at these weddings. Uh, and it's really good food, and there's music, and there's usually free drinks, and there's all sorts of stuff that's happening. And it's, a big, it's a big party, right? In fact, the bride and groom, they kind of look forward to the reception more than they do the wedding a lot because they just want to get the wedding out of the way. So imagine going to a big wedding. Let's say there's 200 people here. You know, you're going to have a grand feast, lots of drinks. There's music. There's going to be dancing for somebody that that can actually do that. Um, You know, whatever. I just move. I don't dance. Moving involves you don't move your feet. You know, you just kind of swivel, whatever. Uh, You know, there's that stuff going on, a grand party. Imagine if all the people at the wedding... They get the food in front of them. I mean, the people come serve them food, and it's, it's like whatever you ask for. Think of your, your most favorite meal. I'm not going to fill it in because I was going to say steak, but not everyone likes steak. All right, so like, think of your favorite meal is sitting in front of you, and literally you, you just stare at it, and you don't touch anything, and you don't drink anything, and you don't party or dance or move or talk with anyone. You just sit there. Like all 200 people sit there, and the bride and groom are actually there, and they're looking around. Like, that, that's absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? No one would ever do that at a wedding. And that's what Jesus' point is. He's like, listen, if the bridegroom shows up, I mean, it's party time. The kingdom of God's arrived. What you do when the kingdom of God's arrived, you celebrate. And when you fast, you fast for the purpose of the kingdom of God to arrive. And it's, if it's arrived, you don't fast anymore. Why would you fast if it's happening right in front of you? That's his point. Well, obviously, they don't get that. But that's what he's saying. Because then he says, after that, he says, look, um, the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day, they will fast. So obviously, in the story we know, Jesus doesn't stay around forever, right? He ends up dying on the cross. He rises from the dead. He's around for a little while. And then he ascends into heaven, and he's gone. So he's not physically there again. That's what he's talking about. Now, the Holy Spirit comes, right? We know that part of the story, but this is what he's talking about. Now, it's, they have no clue, obviously, to this. They're obviously, they don't believe he's the Messiah anyway. But his point is, like, that's the reason that my disciples aren't fasting, which is really I mean, interesting to me because the disciples a lot of time don't get it, especially in this book. But they obviously get it here. Like, they're not fasting because they really believe in this Jesus guy being the Messiah, why would we have to fast if we believe this guy is the Messiah? Of course we wouldn't do that. Now, what does that have to do with us? How does that work? Well, I mean, it, it's not too hard to make some connections. You know, I mentioned earlier about the famous words of a dying church, like we've never done it that way before, because he mentions another example, right? He talks about um, you don't sew a patch of... of uh, unshrunk cloth into an old garment. If you ever try, if those of you that are sewing people, um, you probably know the intricacies of that better than I do. I'm not, I didn't ask anybody about that before I did the sermon, so I'm not going to make a comment on it because I'm wise today. Um, but also, I also don't know about this either because I don't drink wine as much, or I also don't put wine in wineskins. But when you would, you know, old wineskins, they, they shrivel up after a while. If you think about like leather that you might not take care of, right? It dries up after a while if you don't continue to take care of it. Well, wine just obliterates wineskins after you keep using it over and over. Even if it's your favorite wineskin, it eventually cracks. And then it ruins everything. It ruins the wineskin. It ruins the wine. And he's using this as examples in talking about fasting to the question that they're having, which is not just about fasting, obviously. It has a much deeper meaning than that. In fact, I think, you know, Jesus' response is very much in, a, in the prophetic tradition of Isaiah. Listen to this uh, from Isaiah 54. He says, uh, Do not be afraid, 
you will not put me to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with com deep compassion I will bring you back. So when he mentions this example to the scribes of the Pharisees, they're going to be very familiar with this text when talking about God as a bridegroom. And it's kind of a little like, you know, Jesus likes to give some subtle jabs uh, using scripture here and there. But what's interesting is what he's trying to tell them, like, look, you know, God's salvation is here. The kingdom of God has arrived, and you've been longing for it for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you've been practicing this fasting for hundreds and hundreds of years. But what's ended up happening is you've longed for God's presence for so long in this practice that you don't even recognize when he shows up. Later, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of tip my hand a little bit, but it end, what ends up happening, and this happens so much to us, we end up worshiping the practice instead of the person. It was a lesson in missing the point. The purpose of fasting is, is longing for the Messiah to come, the kingdom of God to arrive, and Jesus is like, I'm here, and you don't even recognize when I show up. I know Charity mentioned earlier, I was so glad, I just told her uh, earlier that I was so glad that she said what she said, uh, that the Spirit prompted her to say what she said. I mean, my 2023 has been not so too. I, it's been like, it feels like 2022 just continuing. And yet at the same time, uh, as I'm, pre I'm prepping for this this week, I'm just laughing. Because we, I think all of us, whether we're curious about God or, or we're still on the fence, whether we've been part of, uh, of a church community for a long time, we all long for God's presence in a fresh way whether we know how to label that or not, right? It doesn't matter where you're at in the journey. We have this longing for it. And if um, there are times when you've seen that happen, if you've been a part of the church, there are times when you, you just have those moments where God just shows up in a special way that you know, you say, this is definitely of God. And maybe, maybe, you did, maybe we did something, or maybe you did something with a group, a method, or something that happened that you tried that really worked for you. And that worked for several years. And then after a while, it just didn't work as much anymore. And then people start challenging this, like, maybe God's trying to do something different. You're like, no, but this worked. I mean, this is really significant in my life. Why, how can you say this is not good? How can you say this isn't going to work? How can you say people can't connect to God this way? Or God's presence can't be felt? Well, it's new wine and old wineskins, friends. Things change, Right? I mean, the things that work today would not work in the first century. Same with the first century working today. There's some principles that will, but the methods don't. The practices might be a little different, even the motivations for some people. And what ends up happening so many times when something uh, is very meaningful to us in, in connecting with God, and sometimes it works for a long time for someone, but it may not do that for other people. We have to start looking for how God can show up in other ways. And the fact is, God is always showing up all over the place, all the time. The question is, do we recognize it when we see it? And the only way that you can recognize it is if you understand that you need to replace the wineskin. That you don't hold on to the old wineskin as the eternal way of connecting to God. And these Pharisees were fasting for so long, for hundreds and hundreds of years, that the practice became the worship. We're worshiping the practice. In fact, that, that's how they structure their whole entire faith. We're going to talk about that more a lot more next week because we're going to talk a lot more about how they viewed the Bible. But they, they organized their practice as a bunch of rules and regulations to follow, to be pure and holy. And they missed the point of what the law was designed to do, the Torah. And Jesus is like, look, I'm here. Why would you ever be trying to long for my coming if I'm already here? You're, you, you've done it so long that you end up worshiping the practice and missing the point of who you're worshiping, what you're doing it for. And I think a lot of times that happens in church as well. 
We can, we, we're so focused on doing things certain ways. And when God shows up in new ways, and, and most of the time, it's, un, it's stuff that we don't predict. It's stuff that we can't understand. It's not something that we planned usually. But the question is, can we recognize it when, it, when he shows up? And that takes a particular posture of humility. You have to be teachable. You have to say, you know what? God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, in whatever way that he wants. And here's the twist. Because Jesus said he's not going to be with him all the time, right? We know the Holy Spirit's with us. He's ascended. So now we're in this kind of in-between stage. Some people label uh, this already not yet. You might have heard that phrase before. The kingdom has arrived, but not yet. And so we actually live in this tension right now. We live in this part where Jesus came, and now he's ascended, but we have the Holy Spirit. But the promise is, at the end of the scriptures, that he's going to return. And when he returns, the full restoration of heaven will come to earth. Heaven and earth will merge into one. That's Revelation at the end of the story. And God will dwell with his people forever. That's the story. But that hasn't come yet. So not yet. So now what? what do, how do we live with this? Now, now you fast, and you're longing again for this, except now it's the second coming of the Messiah. So fasting has a little bit different purpose, but there's this tension that we live in. And I, I'd say, you know, now what it is, this is what I feel like right now in 2023. I would call it, you know, the already not yet tension for me is beautiful yet broken. Have you ever heard of a paradox before? You know what a paradox is? A paradox is two seemingly contradicting things being true at the same time. So, so, so for example, in the Bible, one of the paradoxes is that Jesus is fully human, 100% fully human, and 100% fully God. That seems like a paradox. How can those two coexist together? Well, the paradox in play here is how can things be beautiful, and yet we know for most of you, I've heard these stories, and what I've told you mine, 2022 and the end of 2023 is very broken. What do you do in the midst of that? How does this come into play? Because now Jesus is like, we're kind of in between, and the fasting thing is back in play. How does this work? I think it's this way. Are there moments that you've seen the kingdom of heaven in pockets come to earth? Because that's what Jesus is praying for in his prayer. You remember that? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as is in heaven. He prays, for, he prays for heaven to come here. And there's moments when God's will is being done where a little bit of heaven intersects with earth. And in fact, we, we talked about this Christmas, like we're the temple. The temple is supposed to be where heaven and earth meet. There's a lot of charge of that about, hey, the practices that we do is supposed to usher people into the presence of God. And there's pockets where that happens where you know things are like, this is right, this is something good, this is... This is holy and sacred, and those moments happen, and guess what you should do in those moments? You should celebrate. You should call those things out. I think people do a really good job of that here. I think we need to do more of it. I want to hear more of those stories, the everyday. We, we say our mission is living the good news of Jesus seven days a week. I told you a story last, uh, last month of someone, uh, just at, at Dollar General, right? Just a small story of an interaction in the everyday. That's what we're talking about, everyday interactions where the good news is put on display, and that should be celebrated. And yet, there's a lot of brokenness. There's some of you who are walk, have walked through tremendous suffering and pain in the last few months. And we've walked through that with them together in our church community for some of the, you people who know some of these journeys. And that's not counting your own individual journeys with pain and suffering. And one of the things that I was taught early on in my church life that was destructive was to minimize that, was to minimize the brokenness, to try to gloss over it, to try to, to, try to say, it's not as bad as you think. It, this is the thing that happened often. You know, you don't have it as bad as so-and-so. You, heard, you ever said that or heard someone say that? That actually minimizes the suffering that someone is going through or that you're going through, even if you say it to yourself. And in this tension of already not yet of beautiful and broken one of the things and and the bible is so explicit about this it has a huge sections of lament 
of, of fully grieving pain and suffering and loss and mourning that's actually healthy for you to do. Sometimes it really hurts. And unfortunately, sometimes it's not like a one-time thing, right? It comes back over and over again. For example, we just had Christmas, right? If you lost a loved one, it doesn't matter when it happened, whether it was near Christmas, it's harder when it's near Christmas or not, but man, you sure think about it at Christmas, don't you? And there's a healthy thing at that moment to grieve that loss and say, look, we really miss them. And it's okay. And God wants you to pour your heart out. It doesn't matter where you're, the, it, where you're at. And at the same time in this tension, what's so beautiful about it and so much the scripture has to allude to is that even in the midst of all that, there still can be beauty. It's not minimizing the pain. Have you ever had, um, oh man, have you ever had a moment of deep loss and you're wrestling through that and you talk with someone else about it and they share with you about some deep loss that they recently had that you never knew of before and you have this conversation and when the conversation is over, they are like, I'm glad I'm not alone. You know, I, someone said that two of the most powerful words that you could say to someone is me too. I think it's so true. And yet, there's such, if, if, that, if, if you didn't go through that horrible, tragic loss of pain, and, and, in the, and still in the midst of grieving that, and, and you have this conversation, and that person actually has helped I mean, it's, I mean, that maybe would not even been your intention. You just happened to be there. And yet God is continually in the business of taking things that are tragic and harmful and horrible and turning them into a gift. Man, only God can do that stuff. In fact, when we get later in the story, we get to that cross. I mean, that's, that baffles me every time. I mean, this perplexes me. I mean, we, we celebrate this symbol as something great, as a symbol of hope. And man, that just doesn't make any sense. I mean, most people outside the church think we're just not so. Like, why would you celebrate a Roman execution method as hope? Because only God does that kind of stuff. And there will be a time, friends, in this text when Jesus comes back, we won't have to be fasting anymore, longing for the second coming of Jesus. And when he comes back, all this stuff that you're grieving now, the brokenness, the pain that you feel, God says he's going to eradicate it. He's wiping it off the face of the earth. I, I don't know, I can't even imagine what that's like. I, I can't. But that's the great hope that we hang on to. And Jesus proved that when he rose from the dead, that that had no hold over us anymore. And you can have hope in that in the midst of the brokenness. So yeah, Fasting can be still a good thing and a good practice now. And all sorts of things of connecting with God, and, and we should be fully grieving and fully celebrating both at the same time. And with that, I, think, I hope you notice this. In the midst of both of that, you sense the relationship element with God there. How close God wants to be with you. That's Jesus' point to the scribes. You have, you, you've, you've missed the point. You're fasting and you're trying to do all these right things of being a, a great Jew or a great Christian, if you will. And really what all that is about is a closer relationship with God. God wants you to pour your heart out to him, no matter if you're grieving or celebrating. Man, guys, you've missed the point. They just want to pick on how the disciples are doing all the wrong things according to what the tradition is. And so, friends, whatever that is for us, I mean, there's lots of conversations where we focus on all sorts of the wrong types of things. Even like who can be in what groups and, and what have you and, and who can do the right things or who's qualified to do what and that. And yeah, there's, there, there's longer conversations for that. But at the heart of it is this essence of relationship, which for us, if you haven't been here, we have a strategy at this church of how we do relationships. Does anyone remember what it's called? Table to table. 
you can read up on it on our website if you'd like, but table to table necessitates deep, connective relationships. And what that means is not just when things are good, but when things are hard. And I'm going to tell you right now, I mean, I'm not, I'm not bashing us today at all. I have been so thrilled of how our church has responded in the last several months to the pain of others around us. I, I honestly think that's one of the reasons that momentum is moving forward here, it, which is crazy to think about because it's been really hard for a lot of us, personally and corporately. And yet, because of this presence, of this belief, of this already not yet tension, this beautiful yet broken type of life, and being transparent about that and walking alongside each other in the midst of that, there is something beautiful that comes with that because of the hope that we have. And I don't know what that is for you this week. Maybe, maybe for you the question to be asking uh, this morning is, is this. I'm going to put it on the screen, Matt. I think it's the last one there. Are you holding on to something, maybe for you, that's worked in the past so much, of, of a way of connecting with God, of, of whatever, that you're just refusing to see the new thing that God's showing you right now? That's what I have to ask myself this week. And, man, I asked that question, and God started answering this question pretty quickly, uh, like almost like, you know, kind of snickering in some ways. I, I snickered because I, I just, I'm so stubborn. Because when you get so involved in that and, and things work a certain way and then you get comfortable because it's worked for a while, or maybe you just, you know, you forgot about people and because, you know, things just happen. And maybe you feel like, well, God's really not working now because this isn't happening anymore. But maybe there's something new right in front of you that, that's been happening all along. The bridegroom's here. Maybe you need to see that. Maybe there's people coming alongside you that you didn't realize who are asking and asking and asking. It doesn't matter if you don't know what to tell them. But do you recognize that that is a way that God is reaching to you? That he's showing up when you say that he isn't? I don't know what that is for you this week. But just ask that question. I, I guarantee you, if you ask that question, he's going to answer that. He's going to show you. If you ask him to open your eyes to that. I, I, I believe that uh, upon the promises of Scripture and the character of God, that he is definitely going to answer that question. So let's pray together as we, as we reflect on that. God, I just, um, I'm so amazed at the journey of so many of us in the last several months of how difficult it's been. And there's all sorts of degrees of suffering that have happened here. And yet, God, I'm so amazed of how you've continued to gather your people together to walk alongside in love, which is exactly what you do with us. And so, God, I pray that, um, God, we would be the type of church that recognizes when the wineskins get old and need to be replaced. God, I pray that we don't hold on um, too much to our egos that we worship the practices and methods instead of you. God, I pray that we would um, continue to focus on the things that matter to you. And God, that you would prompt us this week of what one specific thing that would be, one, one way that you're showing up that we haven't been aware of um, that you would show us this week, whether that be a circumstance or a relationship that we have, um, something uh, in our job at school, with a particular person, maybe a, a conversation that we've been having ongoing, whatever that is, God, I pray that you would show us. God, I pray that we would, um, when we're tempted to say we've never done it that way or it's never happened that way before, God, maybe remember that you are the kind of God that is always breathing fresh uh, life into new things and new ways and unexpected ways and surprising ways. May we be open uh, to seeing that. In the name of Jesus, somebody said, amen. Uh, if you're able, let's all stand together as we receive this word of benediction. Benediction is just a Latin word that means a uh, good word. And so uh, we always just want to provide a blessing as we go. Before we uh, give the good word, um, if you need prayer, Josh mentioned that one of our values is, is prayer filled. That, that means more than just like saying prayers, but it's, it's, it's a posture for us. Um, prayer filled really is longing for a, re a deeper relationship with God. And we need to do it together. And Carol and Mary Ellen are here uh, on the side over here. If you need some prayer today for whatever it is, um, they are, love to hear your story, love to pray with you, um, and uh, petition the throne uh, of a God who's so good to us. But receive this word uh, of benediction, if you will. May you have your eyes open 
to the fresh ways that God is showing up around you. May you live the paradox of celebrating what's beautiful and grieving what is broken. And may you live in hope of the full restoration of heaven coming to earth as we await Jesus' return. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.